space at Madrid with the goal, no more, no less, than build an AI that understands the source code. But, well, AI that understands the source code. If you're like me, you'll be like, what, what, what does it mean? It's actually hard to define what it means to understand, but what we can tell is that if you understand something, you should be able to do some judgments, like making a call on, for example, developer experience based on artifacts that you published online, such as a source code, or things like better tools. Uh, we should be able to do some kind of assisted programming uh, better than what we do now with uh, code completion tools. Uh, if you want more details on a particular application, there is a great blog post. I'm going to publish the slide. You can read up. And from here, well, before going into details, we're going to establish some technical common ground for what this mean called understanding in more details. Well, first thing, in order to get there, we need to build some kind of common representation of things like code, developers, and projects. And uh, this whole talk is based on research that was that resulted in a paper submitted to a conference recently. And it's not like first research ever in that field, of course, but it stands on intersection on fields like mining software repositories and machine learning. And uh, today I'm going to present results of the first large-scale research, empirical research in that area. And uh, well, let's go into details. What it means. Uh, representation here. So at the high level, we got the hypothesis that, well, there is a source code that written in different languages, but each language have uh, just a predefined set of different tokens there. Other than that, it has things like names and identifiers, which are basically natural language things. Uh, and that could be a resource of information uh, describing each project. And the goal is to build some kind of model or representation, that's what we refer here, with, uh, which exhibits some kind of notion of similarity between those things. And then, using that representation, we can do interesting things like, an example, clustering repositories based on areas or topics. And uh, like, I'm pretty sure everybody familiar with clustering, but just on a high level, it's a branch or um, task inside machine learning. It's unsupervised, meaning that we don't need really labeled examples in order to be able to learn that. And uh, there are many algorithms, uh, like how we actually can do these things. Well, I'm going to be mentioning and focusing mostly on one particular thing we found fruitful, which is topic modeling. And uh, general task of topic modeling described with this, this example. Uh, well, it, it, it concerns itself with a set of documents. Each of them consists of the words. And all those documents are about some kind of topics that represent some kind of topics. And uh, the goal here is to recover those topics. So uh, there are multiple machine learning algorithms how we can do that. And there are classic ones, uh, which described very well and have open source implementation, like LDA. I think the original paper was by Andrew in, in 2003. And then uh, probabilistic light and semantic analysis. Uh, those first two things, I think they're mostly based on algebra things like matrix decomposition and stuff. But there is something new uh, in that field called uh, adaptive regularized topic modeling, which was done by a Russian professor quite recently. And that's what we're going to use because it has uh, strong theoretical properties as well as memory efficient and parallelizable implementation done by PhD students of the professor. I believe he's in Moscow. So, um, and uh, as far as machine learning goes here, that, that's basically it. And the reason is that um, there are many like, parts of building a product based on machine learning things. And here's a picture from a recent paper published by Google about uh, analyzing their machine learning workflows. And basically that black box in the middle, that's where machine learning uh, itself as uh, like math and things is and uh, everything else around all the engineering task of how to gather the data and uh, filter and uh, represent it and then serve the results things like that so um, i mentioned large scale experiment uh, meaning that our source will be the whole github that's that's uh, the scale we're talking about right now and we're going to do a number of steps before getting to machine learning and topic modeling uh, here are the steps 
So basically for every repository out there on GitHub, we're gonna get only source code files, which have the source code, not like documentation or something else. Then we're gonna parse it and get only the natural language part, like names, identifiers, and build something that is known as bag of word model out of it. Very simple, but very efficient. And then uh, it's not enough just to, to train machine learning algorithm based on that model because on the GitHub itself, we got a lot of things like forks, which will screw up the statistics for topic model. We're gonna filter out those on this scale. And then we can do things like cluster by topic. And I'm gonna go through the steps one by one very briefly and describe particularly which uh, open source things we use to do that and which we build ourselves. So the first thing is like we fetch the old, uh, for every repository and then we classify uh, source code files using the tool it's open source by GitHub and it's the same tool that is used to build these bars with the languages called linguist. So well, we have uh, internally our own implementation which is more efficient reason to go but we use uh, Ruby one here and it supports 400 languages. So um, we, we should be able with that we are able to identify only files containing source code and the language it's written in. From there, we parse those with existing parser, which is syntax highlighter, um, pigments. It's also an open source project, famous in Python ecosystem. It supports also 400 plus languages, but well, there's different 400 languages. Intersection is about 200 common languages that both libraries <laughs> and pigments support. What it does that for every token inside the source code file, it assigns a class to it, whether it's a name or uh, some kind of uh, built-in um, command or token. And we are particularly interested in token types called uh, token name. So uh, after doing that, we should we can go and build the bag of word model, which is just a set of tokens inside every repository. So um, before doing there, before doing that, we are do naming convention breaking. Like every language has some kind of naming convention. Like uh, we want to be able to extract words out of it. Here's an example. Uh, which after that, from the whole GitHub, we have about 19 million unique tokens that way, which is quite a lot. Uh, then applying other natural language processing tools like stemming uh, for things that longer than six characters, we were able to drop that number up to 16 unique tokens. And um, from there, the last thing is to count the term frequency. And we've got uh, every repository is mapped to a bag of word with its frequency. So the thing before doing machine learning on top of that representation is uh, filter out forks, GitHub itself. I think it was done on down of the GitHub based on December 2016. It have about 70 million of repositories. And, uh, first way we can filter out forks that are explicitly marked as fork in the GitHub. That will give us 19 million uh, repositories. But there are forks that are efficiently forked, but not through the GitHub. For example, if you pull something and then push without clicking fork, exactly the same thing. Well, then we can try filtering out colliding hashes that takes down about a million more repositories, but that's still not enough. Uh, because uh, there are a lot of things like, for example, whole Linux kernel with additional driver without commit history pushed to some repository, and that's effectively a fork, but well, we don't know about that. So what we want to do is to filter out those forks as well, and that results in reduction of about two million more repositories, but that's how we do that. So basically what we need to do is for every set of tokens representing every repository, we need to find, well, close or similar things and filter them out. Uh, the naive approach would be, we could just use pairwise similarity, basically creating um, and uh, comparing uh, every one of them, but that's too long and will take a lot of time for that number of repository. That's why we went for something more efficient. We open sourced implementation of uh, weighted mean hash algorithm. So it's basically, um, well, it's uh, some kind of signature for every set that estimates similarity between sets. So the signature is the same with the hyperbole, you can say that the sets are very similar. And we use something called locality sensitive hashing that is uh, proportional. Well, that was, um, we were able to get almost linear time um, algorithm in order to 
filter out those uh, repositories that are effectively forked. And uh, well, the basic like locality sense of hashing is um, in the field of uh, probabilistic data sets. There are many interesting probabilistic data sets out there, but this particular works a bit like a hash table. And it's different from hash table though because its hash function maximizes the probability of uh, collision for similar items. So after building it, uh, we will have a number of buckets, uh, and each bucket will have all the similar items uh, in this bag of more than one. And there are many other interesting probabilistic data sets, like something you might be interested in, and I encourage you to check out maybe like things like Hyperlog or Bloom filters, or things like MinHash here, are example of the same idea. And uh, in the visualization up there, you can see the effect of uh, Hyperlog for per denality estimation of the set. The initial set was like uh, 40, 40 megabytes, an example. And preserving that cardinality information, we could reduce it to two kilobytes, which is super efficient. And uh, well, we do something similar, and we do that on multiple GPUs. And that scales quite well. So that results in uh, 14 million unique tokens. And then we can do the topic modeling part. So topic modeling by itself, you can look at it from algebra perspective. So there is one vector space. Uh, where each repository is represented as a vector and the uh, dimensionality of that space is about 14 millions um, right now, which is quite big. Uh, then what we want to do, we want to project that vector to a smaller dimensionality space of topics. And in our example, we choose to use 256 num as a number of topics. And those uh, dense vectors, usually called as mappings, would be the common ground or representation of each repository we were talking about before. So in order to do that, we use open source implementation of this regularized topic model. Um, it's called Big RTM. It's quite interesting. It has a lot of uh, regularizers implemented. And uh, well, uh, it takes some time to train. But for the old GitHub data set, we were able to do that on a single machine in less than a day. So uh, after getting those representations, the last thing to do is just cluster and uh, cluster those vectors, and it can do that efficiently on GPU as well. Uh, but let's look at the infrastructure that we use for this research. And uh, here's the first of reprocessing part, which is IO bound, and uh, it, it's, it was done on a cluster of 64 Apache Spark machines on Google Data Pro. Uh, the input was about like 100 terabytes or something, representing 19 millions of repos, and in less than one day we were able to preprocess down to a bag of board model for, with this a set of equipment, which is not tremendously big this day. But interesting things after that, like to do uh, f the filtering of those forks, we were actually able to do that on a single machine with multiple GPUs in less than five minutes, but just to calculate the hashes. And that's impressive because we tried doing the same, well, it's, it's compute bound workflow, but it's faster than 400 core CPU clustering. And that's just one machine. And then the rest, which is a machine learning part, was done on a single machine with modern CPU as well, using uh, enough memory. And uh, the good implementation then parallelize as well. And uh, well, we've done all that, so what? And there are a few interesting results. Like here's the list of number of topics, uh, although that's unsupervised training that we use, but there's still manual labor requiring, well, to analyze the, what those topics represent. It was done, uh, in a few days they were labeled by human, and the uh, interesting thing emerged that actually we were, we were able to see some general topics extracted, Things like, uh, well, humans who have body parts, or about nature, or science, or even design patterns in software. Also, um, like we can see that communities, um, like uh, games, things in the gaming industry, or Bitcoin, were representing as a separate topics, presumably because they have unique vocabulary for a related narrative. So we were able to cluster them. And then one thing that we learned that picking the 256 as a number of topics was not really an optimal because some were dual representing multiple concepts and some were just repeating multiple times. So more work needed.
example of one particular topic and the keywords that rank high uh, over the topic, meaning that if this word is in your repository, it will be ranked high in that topic with examples of some repositories. Well, well, that's all good, that's interesting, so it's meaningful results, but the more interesting for me as a software engineer was, well, it, we were able to do that efficiently and not in a way that like, well, let's use a lot of machine and just throw them there. Well, some companies can do that having efficient implementation of cluster management and stuff. But we could go very far with some carefully optimizations and uh, GPU uh, things like compute-bound workflows done on multiple GPUs on a single machine. So that's quite interesting, and there's still space to grow. So we can do more using the same architecture that I described uh, with some careful optimizations. And um, I would hope that all this persuades you in, in, in useful so that's a, that approach. And there are other directions to explore. This this one. So other directions here would include uh, better preprocessing, like experiment with stemming and, and other languages other than English. Uh, things like number of dimensions that I mentioned, like it was not really picked uh, an optimal, you can play with that. Or um, adding more information, uh, we would just clustering based on those um, back of work model, but we can experiment with um, comparing with clustering based on uh, social graph or adding more features to that model. But something we found even more fruitful was, well, trying different models. As a bag of words, as you may know, is a very simplistic model. It loses information about sequences, for example. If you have foo and bar, it's exactly the same as bar and foo. And the uh, more modern natural language processing tool, like worlds or to back or parallel implementation of that one, that's something that is going on right now. Publish results on that as well. So, well, it's open source conference, and uh, what's in it for you as an open source uh, activist person or open source engineer? There, I wanted to highlight a number of tools that we used or we implemented, so you can use if you want to do something similar. First, it is a Git implementation made in Go language. That's that's something that allows us to build a scalable infrastructure to actually have a you have mirror to analyze firsthand. And then there, there is this efficient uh, hashing technique and multiple GPUs. So in case you need to do set similarity, that's if you have set similarity problems, that's something to look at. There are two other projects that were out there and that we use. This is Big Art Game for topic modeling and Apache Spark. You may know it's pretty famous these days. Um, except for that, we, we went a bit further we wanted to, for you to simplify the reproducing of these results, we built Docker images. That you can just want one Docker command, you can run and get the reprocessing pipeline and your machine running. And we published uh, some data uh, with, uh, it's actually all the names extracted, so you can run other machine learning algorithms on the same data, or you can just use the trained model, the one that I mentioned, that we use for clustering. So with that, I wanted to thank you, and if you're interested in things like that, Source is hiring, so talk to me later. Um, I think we have time for questions, if you want to. Thank you. to use 
question that's a research, first of all. Uh, so that was, um, at the beginning I mentioned that as a company it has its goals of, its goals of, of building better tools in, in different ways. But this particular research, whether it was kind of feasibility research, whether it's even possible, like the hypothesis I mentioned before is like, well, the source code is quite similar to natural language in, in a way because it has natural language embedded in names, whether it's true or not, whether we can extract meaningful representation based on that information. That was the goal. Actually, it looks like it is. So using more advanced technique, we got more advanced results. And this particular uh, result is just taxonomy, as you say, which is not very useful with this number of topics uh, anyway. But it was feasibility research mostly. So we were able to get interesting results and we're pushing that further with more complex models. And hopefully that will lead to some kind of more sophisticated products that uh, as a company we can build. But and well, there are many things in that domain you can try and do that. So that's quite exciting. Well, if there's no other question, thank you again. Oh, yes.